This is the CBS Evening News with Roger Mudd. Sponsored by Standard Oil Company, New Jersey. Now, direct from the CBS Newsroom in New York, in color, here is Harry Reasoner substituting for Roger Mudd with Charles Collingwood in London, Larry Pomeroy in Tel Aviv, Marvin Kalb in Washington, John Lawrence in Philadelphia, Phil Jones in Augusta, Barry Serafin in Washington, and Hughes Rudd in Colon, Michigan. Good evening. The Middle East conflict boiled over today with four airplane hijackings and the Israeli government pullout from the Middle East peace talks. Arab guerrillas have claimed responsibility for the hijackings, including one that was aborted at London's Heathrow Airport. CBS News correspondent Charles Collingwood reports. The only plane that got away from today's Palestinian-orchestrated extravaganza of hijacking was significantly the El Al flight from Amsterdam, which made a successful emergency landing at London Airport, one would-be hijacker dead, the other subdued. LL flights not only carry armed security guards these days, but the crews have been trained for just such emergencies. And when the hijackers made their move near the English coast today, the drill went into effect. The steward grappled with the gunman, his girl accomplice's arms were pinioned, and the pilot undertook violent acrobatics to throw the intruders off balance. The hijacker wounded the steward and was in turn shot dead by the guard, but the girl was subdued and in spite of the extreme danger from gunfire in a thin-skinned jet, the flight made it into London still under El Al and not the hijacker's command. The passengers had all settled down out of Amsterdam when the hijack attempt erupted, but they kept their heads. I was on the window seat, and the woman sat next to me, the man sat on the aisle seat. As a matter of fact, when they came in, they asked the stewardess, were two seats together. It was a crowded plane, and she found these two seats that had been vacated by passengers who had got off in Amsterdam. Originally, he sat in the center seat, and the girl sat on the aisle. Then they chose to exchange places so that he was on the aisle seat. Then suddenly, we were in the air, sailing smoothly. I was reading, and they were very quiet. They didn't say a word to anyone, either to themselves, to one another, nor to me. And then suddenly, he rose, and he let out a bellow, an animal-like bellow, and he had this little tiny pistol in his hand. And she ran after him, and the two of them were behind the curtains into first class, and then we heard some shots that sounded like cap pistol shots, but apparently it was more than that. So what sort of people were they? She, they looked quite ordinary. You would never pick them out in the crowd. The popular front for the liberation of Palestine, to which today's coordinated series of hijackings are attributed, is a Marxist Palestinian splinter group. Its purpose was obviously to try to throw a larger monkey wrench into the movement toward peace in the Middle East than the guerrillas have been able to achieve on the battlefield itself. Charles Collingwood, CBS News, London. There were 148 passengers aboard the El Al plane and nearly 450 aboard the three other planes which were hijacked and diverted toward the Middle East. All the flights were headed toward New York when they were hijacked and three of the incidents occurred within a period of about an hour and a half. A TWA flight from Tel Aviv was hijacked shortly after takeoff from Frankfurt, and commando leaders say that it has landed at a revolutionary airport somewhere in Jordan. Swiss Air says that its jet from Zurich, hijacked over France, has landed at a military airfield in Jordan. Palestinian commando leaders said the plane would be held in an effort to secure the release of three commandos, prisoners in Switzerland, since a shootout at an LL plane in 1969. Pan Am's flight from Brussels, the only 747 jet hijacked today, was taken over after takeoff from Amsterdam and has landed at Beirut in Lebanon. The guerrillas professed pride in the hijackings. After the Swiss airplane was taken, a woman identifying herself as an Arab commando called the Zurich Control Tower. Israel's decision to boycott the UN-sponsored peace talks was not ex unexpected. For several days now, high government officials have expressed anger at Washington's mild response to their charges of Egyptian truce violations. 
Our report on the Israeli move and what it means for U.S. policy begins with Larry Pomeroy in Tel Aviv. Israel's decision to suspend its participation in the Mideast settlement discussions amounts to an ultimatum that the success of the American peace initiative now depends on the correction of the Egyptian ceasefire violations. Ambassador Yosef Dekoa, Israel's alternate delegate to the talks, will return to New York, but only to take up his regular duties at the United Nations. The announcement was also the strongest evidence yet that Defense Minister Moshe Dayan had won his argument inside the cabinet. He had threatened to resign unless the government took an unyielding position on the repeated breaches of the military standstill on the Egyptian side of the Suez Canal. Jerusalem has now left it up to Washington to enforce the original guarantees for a complete ceasefire. Larry Pomeroy, CBS News, Tel Aviv. This is Marvin Kalb in Washington. Israel disappointed the Nixon administration today, but did not surprise it. The evidence of Egyptian violations of the standstill agreement is now overwhelming, even to those State Department skeptics who tended to discount Israel's early charges. Key officials concede privately that the Egyptians and the Russians continue to build missile installations in the standstill zone near the Suez Canal, that there are more than 200 new missile launchers in that zone, supported by several hundred others immediately to the rear. On an almost daily basis, U.S. officials have appealed to the Egyptians to stop the new construction and to pull the missiles back. The Egyptian reply is that U.S. intelligence is faulty. Cairo says nothing about withdrawing the missiles. U.S. officials feel confident Israel will not attack the new missile sites for the time being. They think Israel wants the foreign ministers to take a crack at resolving the missile question before resorting to military action. That chance comes at the United Nations in just one week's time. Marvin Kalb, CBS News, Washington. In its biggest single aid grant to Cambodia since the ouster of Prince Sihanouk, the United States today turned over six new helicopters worth a million and a half dollars to the Lan Nol government. The helicopters were delivered to Phnom Penh in spite of a statement by Vice President Agnew on his recent Far Eastern tour that the Cambodians were not seeking sophisticated equipment. In Vietnam, the U.S. command announced today that three squadrons of Marine jet fighter bombers will be withdrawn from the war zone later this month and return to the United States. Fighting today was reported light throughout Indochina. fabled King Ranch in Texas. The cattle are part of the Santa Gertrudis herd, the first breed developed in America, now prized and bred in 48 lands. The Santa Gertrudis get nothing but the best. Good grazing, good water. This stream flows from the world's largest natural gas plant, run by Jersey's affiliate Humble Oil and Refining Company. The gas plant uses water for cooling, thousands of gallons an hour. When the water comes out of the gas plant, the Santa Gertrudis drink it. Enough said. There were workshops and discussion groups today at the Black Panther-sponsored Revolutionary Convention in Philadelphia. In spite of fears of violence, the large gathering has been peaceful, with all the expected militancy confined to rhetoric. A report from John Lawrence. The Revolutionary People's Convention is nearing its conclusion, inspired by the fiery rhetoric of the Black Panther leader, Huey Newton. A capacity crowd of more than 5,000 radicals, more than a third of them young white people, cheered wildly here at Temple University last night as Newton declared, we will achieve our manhood even if we have to level the face of the earth. In unison, the delegates raised their clenched right hands and cried the Panther slogan, power to the people over and over again. Newton declared that black and other oppressed people have lost faith in the leaders of America and the system of government. It must be replaced, he said, by a new system within the framework of socialism. Newton warned that the revolutionary movement will make that change by any means that are effective. It is not possible to show Newton's speech on television because the Panthers set a $25,000 price tag for filming it. 
A violent showdown between the radicals and the police was narrowly avoided as the meeting broke up last night. Several hundred of the delegates took to the streets, stoning some automobiles and police cars. But they broke up before any serious confrontation. Police Commissioner Frank Rizzo strolled confidently outside his headquarters, saying he was ready for anything. A serious engagement might have been a massacre. The 6,000 delegates who registered for this convention will finish their serious work tonight, begin to leave town, ending the danger of what many people feared would be a violent, bloody climax after a week of police shootings. John Lawrence, CBS News, Philadelphia. Earlier this week, two Augusta, Georgia policemen were indicted by a federal grand jury looking into the deaths of six blacks this past May. CBS News correspondent Phil Jones went to Augusta to report on the city and its response to the spring riots. There is frankly very little positive news to report from this sleepy southern community that once lived on its reputation for quaintness and the elite Masters golf tournament. Things just seemed to fall apart last May 11th when blacks teed off on a 100 block area. And when police moved in to put a stop to it all, bullets whizzed through the air. And when it was all over, six black men were dead. Negroes claimed it was to protest the beating death of a young, mentally retarded youth being held in the county jail for murder. Two of his black cellmates were later charged with a death. And now the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has reached some preliminary findings. First, that rumors of outside presence of the National Black Panther Party on the night of May 11th were untrue, although Panther activity since then has been observed. The GBI investigator, C.W. Herndon, a slow-talking Georgian, has concluded that the Augusta Police Department was ill-trained and ill-equipped. The indications are that there had not been any professional right training within the uh, Augusta Police Department, their equipment was not up to date so far as the uh, riot equipment is concerned. Uh, some of the police officers were sent out into the street into a riotous condition uh, without even a helmet or a hard hat. The police chief at the time of the riot has since retired, and his successor is James Beck a police captain when the disorder occurred. Beck has been on the Augusta police force for nearly 20 years. He refuses to comment on past police administrations. But the police department is not alone in the GBI findings. Blacks have not cooperated with the state investigation. We have found people. We found, uh, we had a list of the names of those that were treated at the hospital. Uh, we've gone out and talked to uh, most of them, the ones we could find. They tell you anything? Our agents have had the door slammed in their faces. I think that both sides are, are not willing to uh, sit down and really discuss their problems and be honest with one another. There have been a few efforts to ease Augusta's post-riot tensions. Examples, 150 kids now employed on the neighborhood youth corps. For all the underprivileged youngsters enrolled in the summer recreation program, there's a Feed a Kid project, one meal a day. The Youth Corps and the Feed a Kid programs are easily financed since the federal government pays 90% of the tab. Construction has not been started, but approval was granted for water and sewage in one of the densely populated low-income, primarily Negro sections of the city and county. There are still no plans to cope with all the substandard housing and lack of paved streets. However, since May 11th, the city has received approval for 500 low-income and elderly housing units. The fad since May's violence is for white officials to make ghetto tours. Shortly after the riot, Mayor Millard Beckham made his journey, was shocked at what he saw, said he was going to do something about it. A month later, he was still saying he was going to do something about it. But he saw more fault with blacks than the government. I said I had seen things that were hard for me to believe. That one would have to see it in order to believe it. What is it you don't believe that you saw? That people could allow themselves to live in such filth without actually exerting themselves to some extent to do something about it. Said, well, I'm going to try and see if I can't get it all cleaned up, whether it's my responsibility or not.
The black community is split, and out of the leadership gap has come an organization called the Committee of Ten, an umbrella for new young Negro spokesmen. However, thus far, the committee members have been spending most of their time opening offices and trying to convince everyone that they are the new Negro leaders of Augusta. Grady Abrams, one of four black members of the Augusta City Council, is a member of the Committee of Ten. But then there are others who have this interest of uh, money-making, this capitalistic views. What can I gain from the ride? How many buildings can I buy? Uh, how many businesses can I open up? Nobody, these people aren't thinking about the six fellows that died. They aren't thinking about the families that were put out of their homes. They aren't thinking about the blacks who lost their jobs because of the riot. This is not on their mind. They're only thinking about how much I can gain uh, in a capitalistic way. These are black people you're talking These about. These are black people. With few exceptions, Augusta business and industrial development has risen steadily without Negroes. Many blacks have watched the city grow and prosper while they continued isolated and frustrated in their menial jobs. For them, the silent, law-abiding minority, a riot hasn't changed things. Until last May, a riot in Augusta, Georgia, seemed impossible, but yet it happened. And now, nearly four months later, and with school desegregation tensions running fairly high in the area, both blacks and whites show little evidence of being willing to work together to solve their problems. Phil Jones, CBS News, Augusta, Georgia. We live on a tiny, fragile, vulnerable planet. We must learn how to care for it. Six years ago, Standard Oil Company New Jersey affiliates began using a method for washing tanker compartments at sea that helps to eliminate putting any oil into the ocean. We developed into using an underwater seismic device that replaces dynamite in oil exploration and does not harm marine life. ESSO researchers are working with auto manufacturers to develop emission systems and fuels which together will be virtually pollution free. Our affiliates are building plants in Venezuela and Aruba to take sulfur out of heavy fuel oil used by our eastern cities. We've spent millions of dollars to improve the environmental performance of our refineries and chemical plants, new and old. Real accomplishment, enormous cost. But there is much more to be done. The search for and production of oil by ESSO affiliates must continue to be accompanied by vigilant care for the ecology. Our refineries will be looked at again and again for ways to improve their environmental performance. We will continue to seek ways to improve our transportation methods on land and sea. It will take continued effort and dedication to solve our problems. But all industry, indeed all citizens and their municipalities, will have to act with equal concern. To improve the total environment will take time. It will take billions of dollars. And the cost will have to be shared by all of us. We intend to do what one company can do to improve the quality of life on this planet. This will be a long and difficult battle, but this is a battle we must win. A bomb exploded early today in front of a house in Minneapolis, killing one man and causing extensive damage on several blocks. It was the first fatality in seven bombings in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area during the past three weeks. Police say they have not determined whether the unidentified victim was carrying the bomb or just walking by when it exploded. Heavy rain fell this weekend in central Arizona and southern Utah, killing 12 persons, forcing the evacuation of hundreds of families from their homes and closing major highways. One of the drowning victims was an Arizona highway patrolman whose patrol car was engulfed by water. The President's Commission on Campus Unrest is back in Washington after several weeks of hearing testimony at Kent State, Jackson, Mississippi, and other college communities that have been hit by violence. Barry Serafin has a report on what the Commission members are doing now and how they are reacting to recent criticism leveled at them. After hearing more than 80 witnesses over the summer, the commission is meeting behind closed doors in this office building a few blocks from the White House to draft what is expected to be a two to three hundred page report. 
Commission members are tight-lipped about the conclusions that report may contain, but they take exception to criticism by Colorado Senator Gordon Allett that the investigation has been hasty and designed to whitewash campus radicalism. It's no longer a question of who's right and who's wrong. Uh, the, question, the country is tumbling into a terrifying period, and we must back off from this period. And it won't help, you know, to talk about whitewashing anybody. I don't think that's the intention of the commission. We're trying to aliven the, the, the American people to how serious this condition is and how we must move swiftly and compassionately away from this precipice. Has there been considerable disagreement among members of the commission? There's, the commissioners are almost of one mind. We've, we've seen what we've seen. We've heard the country speak out to us in many ways, and I don't think there's much uh, doubt in the commissioner's mind as to how serious things are and what kind of things have to be done. We're going to make some very serious recommendations as to the use of official force, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure what those are yet, but they're going to be some very serious ones, and also some very specific ones to the president as to what he can do to, to help us as a nation come back together again. Committee sources say there have been no attempts by the White House to influence the commission. The panel's report is expected in two to three weeks. Barry Serafin, CBS News, Washington. This is butyl rubber. Rubber made from oil. Jersey scientists invented it, and our affiliate, NJ Chemical Company, makes it. Here on the Hawaiian island of Molokai, they have a water problem. It rains in the mountains, but down where the pineapples grow, it doesn't rain enough. They have to pipe the rain from the mountains and store it near the pineapples. So they dug a hole and lined it with butyl rubber. It makes quite a reservoir, more than five million square feet of it. When it's filled, they'll have at least two years' water supply for the pineapples. Molokai's economy depends on pineapples. What's good for the pineapples is good for the people. Life in the 1970s is so amazing, so frustrating, that merely finding a rabbit in your silk hat may not seem very magical. But correspondent Hughes Rudd has found one place where the ancient arts are flourishing. That place is Colon, Michigan. Colon, Michigan looks quite a bit like a lot of other small towns in America. The barber shop on the main street, Masonic Temple. But there is something peculiar about this town. After all, where else on Main Street America could you go window shopping for such items as the Joy Buzzer, the Chinese linking rings, the Chinese bottle, or the amazing yakety yak talking teeth? Titillating tricks and mystifying magical objects are as common in Colon as lutefisk in Minneapolis or enchiladas in San Antonio because Colon calls itself the magic capital of the world. And where there's magic, there are magicians. So every summer, Colon is host to a convention of magicians, both professional and amateur, a veritable pride of prestidigitators who can be found all over town doing what comes unnaturally. Monk Watson is 76 and has been doing things like this for a living since 1919. That's 14-year-old Dan Witkowski practicing his fire-eating bit on the front lawn. 13-year-old Sherry Goss of Waterloo, Iowa, seemed to suspend the law of gravity as long as nobody bumped into that thin, nearly invisible wire which was doing the levitation. More than 800 magicians from all over the country came to town for the convention, which is sponsored by the folks who have, presto, made Colon the magic capital of the world. Abbott Manufacturing, the biggest magic makers in the country, founded about 1900 by an Australian magician who liked the fishing in the area. Professionals come to the convention to show off for other professionals and because they can't resist an audience of amateur magicians. Jim Reno is one of the pros. People have always been fascinated by magic simply because magic essentially is seeing things done which supposedly can't be done, going against the laws of nature. Essentially, being fooled and not understanding the things is one of the points that makes it entertaining to an audience. De Yip Lu came originally from China and once worked with Blackstone, the greatest of them all. Cover the box. 
have to cover the box because this is a foul trick. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> and it's gone. See, it's nothing there. Oh, nothing over here. Nothing over here. Nothing over here. Nope, nothing over here. No, nope, nothing over here. No, nothing over here. Here, here, here. The package on the ground there. Oh, that? No, 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 no. He flew the coop. <laughs> okay. At night, the assembled abracadabra fans gathered in the high school auditorium to watch the professionals really go at it. And as at all conventions, there were pitches about how to sell the product. But Dietrich's specialty is trade shows, which have pretty much replaced vaudeville as the source of most magicians' livelihood. The product, Dietrich says, is more important than the magic. You see, Hoyle has replaced the magic word abracadabra, and it works just as well. Just like magic, when you say Hoyle and hit it there, you see, but it heals up real quick. And plastic coating, your cards won't swell on you, and you'll get a good deal all the time. A showroom of amazing and mystifying products was set up in the high school auditorium, and business was brisk. The Abbott Company's salesman demonstrated such tricks as how to get the little ball into the glass with the aid of a trap door. The customers in search of illusion have all sorts of real-life occupations. There were lawyers, firemen, and ministers. But inside of each lurks a Blackstone yearning to get out. A little ham, I guess, and about everybody that lives, and I have my share of ham. So this is where I express it in magic. Oh, Reverend, uh, what's your interest in magic? Well, primarily as a hobby. We've, uh, we've used this as entertainment uh, for young people's groups and for, uh, uh, in our church groups and also on some of the mission fields of the world. I've uh, found that there's a lot of science in magic, and I think my interest in magic has been stimulated by the scientific aspects. There's a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry, and a lot of mathematics tied up in magic. Abbott's sales manager and a veteran magician is Duke Stern. And he just happened. Would you care to have these as my compliment? Uh, we need escape therapy. We are living in a tight world. We're uh, under pressure. Everybody's trying to make a big buck, I suppose. And uh, magic offers a complete release from the norm. When the convention ends, Colin settles back into what it is the rest of the year, a sleepy little town among the cornfields and creeks where nature performs all the magic and everybody else goes about the business of getting and spending. The nice thing about Colon, Michigan, is that it's just a little town, 1,200 people, and nothing unusual ever happens here at all. Is that a fact? Well, how does this grab you? you lose your head over a little flop. Uh, Hughes Red, CBS News, Colon, Michigan. That's the news. This is Harry Reasoner, CBS News. Good night. This has been the CBS Evening News with Roger Mudd. Sponsored by Standard Oil Company, New Jersey. The CBS Evening News is brought to you seven nights a week in color, Monday through Friday with Walter Cronkite and on Saturday and Sunday with Roger Mudd. The day man landed on the moon, CBS News filmed what Americans were doing from Maine to Hawaii. See A Day in the Life of the United States, Tuesday at 9.15, 8.15 Central Time on CBS.